Hello everyone. This is a story about a type of qubit within silicon, specifically the nuclear spin of an impurity within the silicon structure. Here is the marketing tagline for the system. It theoretically enables a scalable quantum computer to be built that is easy to integrate into existing computers. It functions entirely electronically. It can partially operate at room temperatures. And it is scalable. Of course, there are downsides, but we'll get to those later. As far as I can tell, the first comprehensive proposal for such a system came in a 1998 article in Nature by a researcher named B.E. Keane. While the fabrication technology at the time couldn't build such a device, Keane laid out a system for building qubits that could theoretically meet the requirements for a quantum computer. As will be explained on the next slide, by embedding a phosphorus-31 donor atom within a silicon gate structure, Keane hypothesized that the resulting system would allow manipulation of the nuclear spin of the phosphorus atom through a combination of hyperfine interaction, electronic coupling, and flipping the nuclear spins with AC magnetic fields at resonance. The architecture is attractive because it is theoretically scalable and usable within current silicon-based semiconductor systems. In general, there is a problem with selecting qubits from within silicon systems. Specifically, any silicon system is inherently noisy, and it is very difficult to isolate a chosen qubit within such an environment however easy it would be once you have such an isolated qubit to work with an existing architecture. Keane suggests a solution, which is to use phosphorus-31 as an embedded impurity. Nuclear spins of phosphorus atoms, unlike other possible qubits, operate in what has been termed extreme isolation, especially within enriched silicon-28 systems. The interaction between phosphorus-31 and silicon was examined in the late 1950s, and it turns out that so long as the phosphorus atoms are sufficiently isolated from one another over at least a small distance, and the silicon and the system is operating at under 1.5 Kelvin, the nuclear relaxation time of phosphorus-31 and silicon exceeds 10 hours. Lower temperatures and isolation from phonons can even extend this time. Keane's proposed architecture, an MOS system shown here in a scaled version, accommodates initialization, manipulation, and measurement requirements for a quantum computer. Initialization is accomplished by manipulating the voltages on the A and J gates shown here. A gates control the resonance frequency of the nuclear spin qubits. J gates control electron-mediated coupling between adjacent nuclear spins of different donor atoms. Operationally, electronic field applied to A gate pulls the electron wave function locationally away from the donor and towards the barrier thus reducing the hyperfine interaction and the resonance frequency of the nuclear qubit, and the qubit is thus initialized and can be selectively manipulated. Because each donor atom functions as a voltage-controlled oscillator, manipulation of the qubit is accomplished by the externally controlling the precession frequency, and nuclear spins can be selectively brought into resonance with the external magnetic field, allowing arbitrary rotations to be performed on each nuclear spin. Measurement can be accomplished using purely electronic means, which is an important benefit. The orientation of the nuclear spins determines how the system evolves as the J-gate voltage is increased from zero up into a set voltage, which can be measured by the presence of charge motion between the donor atoms. However, this system has not been built. It requires that the silicon structure be practically free of spin, which will be discussed later, and that the gates be made at the magnitude of only hundreds of angstroms, and importantly, that the donor atoms must be precisely implanted within the silicon structure. Keane recognized that these, advantages, these advances would come, but fabrication technology wasn't there yet. So let's fast forward to 2013, when multiple teams of researchers advanced this system. One thing that I didn't tell you, although it may have been obvious, is that the phosphorus donor atom really acts as a two-qubit system consisting of the nuclear spin qubit as well as a bound electron qubit, which is spin one half. Both these qubits interact with an external magnetic field, although the electron qubit is much more sensitive to this, and with each other through the hyperfine interaction. Now, from this figure, you can see that there are actually four eigenstates for this donor atom. The blue transition arrows show the transitions that will occur from electronic spin resonance, and the red arrows show transitions from nuclear magnetic resonance. The narrow up and down arrows show the state of the electronic qubit electron qubit at each of these eigenstates, and the thick up and down arrows show the state of the nuclear spin qubit. Above cryogenic temperatures, this two-qubit system encounters a problem, because above 10 Kelvin, the nuclear spin qubit loses its long coherence times, and above about 30 Kelvin, the 
phosphorus donor atoms start to ionize, which of course ruins any system that is built assuming this two qubit system, such as one that requires single shot readout, which will be important later. You might be thinking, didn't he promise that this system could be used at room temperature? Well, sort of. So let's take a look, take a look closer. First of all, here's the thing. What if this ionization was a good thing? Specifically, by saying goodbye to the electron qubit through ionization, we now have a single qubit system. This is much easier to work with. Removing the free electron removes a source of decoherence, and the coherence times of the nuclear spin are improved by an order of magnitude. Manipulation is also easier. But now there's a problem. Single shot readout is no longer possible without this electron qubit. Thus, a purely electronic system is no longer within our grasp. The researchers Pla et al. propose their system that balances these demands. The device, for each qubit, has a phosphorus 31 atom ion implanted and tunnel coupled to an MOS single electron, electron transistor, as shown. Rather than using temperature to ionize the phosphorus atom, Pla et al. used the structure itself to accomplish the ionization with a special microwave pulse. Following this pulse, coherent nuclear magnetic pulses are applied to initialize the nuclear spin qubit which is now in an ionized state. Manipulation follows by applying a pulse of a specific length and frequency as desired. Spin echo techniques at this time may also be used to reverse dephasing. The electron is then replaced, so it's unionized, so that single shot readout can be for performed on the nuclear spin. As seen in other single shot readout systems, each individual readout is imperfect and must be performed many times on a coherent nuclear spin to safely ascertain the state of the nuclear spin qubit. However, given the coherence times of the system, and remember, this is a strength, this is possible to do, and the resulting readout fidelities exceed 99.8%, which is the highest reported fidelity of any solid state qubit up until this time. Plot and all, uh, et al. also show that this process can be accomplished without ionization, but the interplay between the qubits make this a less attractive system, as there is more than one resonance frequency and the due coherence times are much shorter, so this is likely not a path to an eventual quantum computer, and we'll continue to focus on this ionized donor atom. Several months later, in November 2013, Saidi et al. improved upon the Swiss system. Specifically, they used highly, almost perfectly enriched silicon-28, as originally desired by Keane. This silicon host provides isolation from a source of decoherence, Additionally, these researchers showed that long-term coherent storage of information at room temperature would be possible in such a thing. Their coherence times far exceeded those of Pla et al. as a result of their enriched silicon-28 structure. Although this current diagram might seem a little complicated at first, it's quite important to follow. Because most of the research of Saidi et al., and to an extent Pla et al., was to determine the specific optical and nuclear magnetic resonance transitions that such a system would require. After all, these need to be very precise for adequate manipulation. This is no easy task, because even though an ionized donor would be created and manipulated, the system needs to start with a neutral donor. The transitions between the original donor, neutral donor, which is labeled D0, and the donor-bound exciton, D0x, are shown from Zeeman splitting in figure A. These correspond to specific optical transitions for the electron labeled 4, 5, and 6 in figure C, and nuclear magnetic transitions for the nuclear qubit shown by RF, up, down, and plus. Figure B simply shows the photoconductive redox spectrum without any D0 hyperpolarization. But keep these transitions from figure C in mind as I walk you through the manipulation process because I will return to them. So, at steps 1 through 3, shown here, the nuclear spin is hyperpolarized with radio frequency pulses, and at step 4 the phosphorus atom is optically ionized. Step 5 isn't so much a step as a place in time, at which about 90% of the atoms have been successfully polarized into the upstate nuclear spin and naturally ionized over time through the Auger process, which is simply a way that a neutral atom may shed an electron. Following this, a Hahn echo sequence is applied in steps 6 through 8 after which a single, research, single shot readout is performed. The researchers use this process to prove the coherence of the ionized donor atom. To be clear, this isn't exactly the process that would operate a quantum computer, but the principles are certainly analogous. So remember those transitions from the prior slide? What's happening here is that the neutral donor 
is optically excited at step 4 to the donor-bound exciton, which it decays through the auger process to create ionized phosphorus in the same nuclear spin state. This happens fairly quickly. The ionized phosphorus returns to the nuclear phosphorus at, directly at step 9. So this is a multiple state process, not just going back and forth between a neutral atom and a ionized atom. Part of what Saidi et al. did was to show that the system could be operated while the temperature is increased up to room temperature while the donor atom is ionized, as shown by the temperature bar at the top. The researchers accomplished this feat with an elaborate system of temperature controls detailed in the supplementary materials, but it's important to note that the cycle takes about 12 minutes, so this is not a rapid process. It is only possible because of the long coherence times of this system, and shows why enriched silicon is absolutely essential. The researchers' results show that the temperature manipulation does come at a price. Only about 62% of the spin coherence remains after the temperature cycle which is equivalent to a state fidelity of 81%. But this is certainly better than the loss of all coherence, which might otherwise be expected from quantum systems which operate only at cryogenic temperatures. So maybe I lied a little bit when I said that this type of system can operate at room temperatures. But I did say partially operate. This is still an important advance. Keep in mind that if the main benefit of such a silicon system is that it can be integrated into a semiconductor system, the amount and timing of cryogenic effects required for a computer would be reduced. It also promises the ability to bridge the gap between systems operating at room temperatures and those operating at cryogenic temperatures. Moreover, if materials with wider gaps, such as diamond, could be implement, implanted with deep defects, such as phosphorus-31 in this system, an analogous system would be able to be initialized and read entirely at room temperatures, thus eliminating the temperature requirement. I don't think that implementation, implantation technology is quite up to this task yet, but it is worth keeping an eye out for. Lastly, all this temperature stuff is cool, but it doesn't necessarily outweigh the other benefits of such a silicon system, namely that it presumably can be integrated into current semiconductor systems. Long coherence times and entirely electronic manipulation and reading processes are both good things, as is the ability of this sort of system to be scaled in a cost-effective manner by piggybacking on existing fabrication techniques. So maybe we stay at cryogenic temperatures and see how far we can get. A Caltech researcher named John Presco proposed in 1998 that a quantum computer would need 10 to the 6 qubits operating at 10 to the negative 6 probability of error to exceed conventional computers at certain tasks such as prime factorization. While this number has likely changed somewhat, the basic fact remains that tons of qubits would be a good thing. And a silicon system using nuclear spin qubits could provide a path to this kind of scalability. Thus, nuclear spin qubits in silicon are an important system, for while they have tempting side benefits, such as the ability to partially operate at room temperatures, or at least store up information at room temperatures, they gain their most important feature simply by existing in silicon, and thus piggybacking on existing technology from the semiconductor industry. Maybe this isn't objectively fair as we compare qubits, but it's the world we have, and it's exciting to see this qubit system's potential. Thank you for listening, and please feel free to ask me any follow-up questions or look at the sources on this slide.